World Wide Web, I understand that I appear between uh, um, Jack Lemmon and Rob Lowe under Naked Men on Film, and they just showed their butts. Channel One the Groove Tube was, uh, was an inline TV show at a private adult club that you could take your friends to uh, and blow their minds with this uh, silly humor. And, uh, and I saw Channel One maybe the first time in 1968 or nine. And here was Chevy Chase and, uh, and Lane Saracen and Ken Shapiro doing all these incredible uh, anti-establishment, uh, just incredibles of false starts of TV shows. And you'd go along and then all of a sudden somebody's taking a bra off or somebody used the F word or whatever it is that lets you know that this is going to be different than regular TV. Uh, the, the role of the hitchhiker had already been outlined uh, for us by Richard Belzer in the original black and white version. And uh, uh, when Ken Shapiro asked me to uh, do the first frontal male nudity in the history of American cinema, I thought that that'd be a great idea. You would just think that uh, it, I could be more famous from that. When I first found out about Buzzy Linhart and I found out he was the guy in the opening scene of that movie. I was like, wow, oh, you know, but uh, my association with him has more to do with art and comics than with music. I used to work at Walker Art Center in Minneapolis as a museum guard, and a lot of my friends that were also museum guards there lived in this ratty old apartment building, and uh, one of my friends uh, introduced me to him. And, uh, so we immediately hit it off talking about comic books and art more than anything and I gradually came to realize who he was but at first it was all about comics. He was like, uh, you know, you ought to do a comic about me. You know, he was kind of like, uh, I'd already had one thing published so I was a brand new, wide-eyed, young, enthusiastic cartoonist and I guess with Buzzy, he liked my comics and uh, he saw an opportunity. He just had all these different stories to tell, and I was like, well, what should we do? And uh, so uh, uh, he invited me to his apartment, and he had all these boxes everywhere, like he probably still does, and he pulled out some stuff, and he pulled out an old interview. Well, he actually gave me a box and said, dig through this box and pick out something in here that might be something you might want to illustrate into a story. I started to work on it, and then Buzzy like mysteriously disappeared out of Minneapolis and it's like you know I was pretty good friends with them but not like enough to where I saw him every day or anything and just like all of a sudden you know he wasn't around. I went ahead and I finished the story and finally an opportunity came up in this magazine called Subliminal Tattoos and it was like I think it was eight years after I drew it that it finally got published and then uh, I, I was hoping Buzzy wouldn't mind and I was also thinking, like, gosh, I hope Buzzy can see this. And uh, so in the introduction, I, uh, I, in the magazine, I, I, I uh, wrote an introduction before the comic and said, you know, I don't know what happened to Buzzy Linhart. He disappeared. He was a friend of mine. We were working on this project together, and he disappeared, and I went ahead and finished it. And now it's like eight, nine years later, and it's finally in print. I have no idea where he is. So if you know where Buzzy is, give him a copy of this magazine. Then like a couple of years later, I got a phone call from him and kind of got back in touch again and everything. And um, he was real happy about it. So this whole package is like, at this point, 10, 13 years old? Yeah, I guess from 89. Yeah, 89 was when I finished it. It's like my second comic strip I've ever done. And I probably wouldn't have done it without Buzzy breaking me down and telling me to not be doing my stupid freelance jobs and do something of artistic merit his life. <laughs> Hey, I got to tell you that you're so damn